Bruce Mayhew, pastor here at Killarney, and it's a privilege to be part of this wonderful congregation. Today I'm beginning my series, God-Centered, Living Your Best Life Now and Forever. God-Centered. I want to call you and encourage you to center your life around God. I want to point out a, a word here, and that word is, is living. Living is something that we do, right? Living is not just something that I believe or something that I say, but it's something that I do. Now, oftentimes I think about living my best life as being something that I experience, something that happens to me in my life. Well, I want to challenge you to believe and to embrace the, um, the, what I believe is the truth, that living your best life is not something that happens to you. Living your best life is living your best life. It's what you do. It's how you live. It's your lifestyle. It's what you contribute to your family, to this church, to this community. What difference you make in the world. That is living your best life. And we can do that. We can live a good life, a best life, by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. I want to begin this morning with a passage of Scripture from John chapter 10 and verse 10. And this is a uh, passage where Jesus um, revealed that he was the good shepherd. He also said, I am the gate. And, and he said that a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So it talks about an enemy, a force that sheep have or that we have. An enemy comes to do what? To take something from you. To take something that God has given to you or to prevent you from receiving something has, that God has for you. And he comes to take that. But he also not only wants to take it, and of course here Jesus is talking about Satan, the enemy that we have. He comes to kill and destroy. Satan does not want you to live your best life. Satan doesn't want you to live the life that God intends for you to live. Satan wants to destroy our lives. He wants to destroy marriages and families. He wants to break apart people and friends. He wants to bring division in communities, in nations, and in the world. And he stirs things up with many different ways, with many different tools, in order to what? To steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said this. He said, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. Or in full. He said, I've come to, to that you may live this life that God has for you to its fullest. Now we think about that, life to the full, and the default thinking is health, wealth, prosperity. And I believe that God does want to bless you. We obey God and follow God, we will be blessed. But I also want you to remember that some of the greatest people who have ever lived some of the greatest lives that have ever walked this earth have endured very, very difficult circumstances. Number one in that is Jesus himself. Jesus had a life. He lived the best life. But it doesn't mean that his life was without trouble or that he lived without opposition. So I've come that you might have life and you may have it in abundance. It says in John 1, 4, in him was life and that life was the light of men. In him was life and that life was the light of men. Now who is him? It's Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh, became human, and dwelled among us. That's Jesus. And it says here that in Him was life. 
Now, what does this mean? If life is in Jesus, it means that this life that Jesus came to give is relational. When the Bible talks about being in Christ or in Jesus, in Him, it means having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So the key to the abundant life is that relationship that you and I have with Him. And to experience that, we need to be God-centered. God needs to be at the center of our lives. And for God to be at the center of our lives, there are things that we have to do. And that's what we'll look, about, look at in the coming weeks as we go forward. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And of course, light gives life itself, but it also directs us. So Jesus came to direct us in the way of life, life that is in Him, in a relationship with Him. So if I want to live a God-centered life, then I have to live a life in relationship with God. You see, it's easy as Christians to focus, because of a lot of theological battles and debates, about a profession of faith, as my life is in that profession of faith, and I'm going to heaven when I die. And so because I know Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I'm going to heaven when I die, but then the life I live every day, I live apart from God. Or maybe God is like a, a, a lucky charm in my pocket, you know? I've got God with me, and He's with me wherever I go. And where am I going? Well, wherever I decide to go. And wherever I go, I'm going to take God with me. Now, that's what, not what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't say that we're supposed to take God with us, but that we're to go with God. A God-centered life means that I see the world from God's perspective. That I'm on a mission with Jesus. You know, Jesus had a mission. And he accomplished that mission through the cross. And he's fulfilling that mission through his people, the church. And we can't separate those things. I can't separate Jesus from his mission and from his church. If I'm God-centered, then that means I, along with the people of God, are following Jesus on his mission. So the center of my life is Jesus and his mission. Which is very different than centered around maybe what I want. Now we can center church around what I want. And a lot of times that's where the battles come in. In our own heart, our struggle with church and with decisions and policies and things. Is, is I want this. And someone says, no, I want this. And there are things that I like and things that I prefer. Jesus didn't even talk about those things for the most part. He talked about the mission. He talked about God the Father. He talked about salvation and deliverance and healing and, and life. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. In 1 John 5, 11-13, John says this. He says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. It's the same thing that he says in John chapter 1. He's given us eternal life and this life is in his son. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a life to be lived in relationship with Jesus. And then he says this, the one who has the son, not a trinket in my pocket, not a good luck charm that I carry around with me, not an idol, but who has a relationship with the Son of God, with God Himself. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now it says to have the Son of God, it doesn't mean I possess God. We think when I have something, that's something that I possess. No. I have a wife, but I don't possess my wife. My wife has a husband, but she doesn't possess me, right? It's a marriage. It's a relationship that we live together every day. He goes on to say 
This is eternal life. That we may know you. This is Jesus, John 17, 3. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Now bring that up here today because this is eternal life. What? It's a relationship. A relationship is something that you live out. And what you say, what you do, what you feel, how you react, how you respond, how you make decisions, all based upon this relationship. So living life, eternal life, the life of God, is a life of relationship with Jesus Christ at the center of your life. This is eternal life. Not just living longer or living forever, but living in a relationship with life itself, the giver of life, because life, of course, is in God. There is no life apart from God. Your best life is not based on your circumstances. It's not based on what you receive, but what you do and who you know and how you live with Jesus. What contribution will you make with your life? What will you give? What difference will you make in this world? Abundant life isn't just individual and material. Abundant life is together. And it's relational. That's why the body of Christ is all about breaking down the barriers between people. And bringing people together in unity in Christ, reconciled with God. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, we'll go back to that passage of Scripture. And um, verse 13 says this. And this is kind of a, a tricky verse for me. And, and reading it recently, I realized, you know, I was taught that in a different way than what it actually says. It says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And I was always taught that scripture that you know you have eternal life because you believe. Now, I believe that's true. I believe that I know I have eternal life because I believe, place my faith in Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. <coughs> but this knowledge... This knowing this life is relational. And I challenge you to go back and read the book of 1 John. And say, what did John write? He said, these things have I written. So go back to John 1, 1 and read through John chapter 1 John 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And say, what did John write? That's going to give me this assurance, this knowledge, this knowing of this life. That God has given to me. And you'll see it's about the testimony of Christ. It's about forgiveness of sin. But it's also about relationship. So I encourage you to read 1 John this week and say, what did John write about this life? Eternal life. Knowing this life. He says, I read the road these things that you may believe, who, who believe, may so you may know you have eternal life. I think sometimes we have doubt and fear because we are living our life centered on something else besides God. I made that profession of faith. I believed in Christ. I have faith in Christ. But I'm living my life apart from God. I'm walking my own path. I have some other priority, something else I'm giving my life to, and I don't experience that life. I think that's a big part of this insecurity and doubt that we often have is, is that we don't have the relationship. Maybe I've got the five top things I believe, but that's different than having the top five things I do with Jesus. What are you doing with Jesus this week? What are you going to do with Jesus this afternoon? How are you going to live your life with Jesus? And you say, why are you saying all this? Because Jesus said life, eternal life, is a relationship. He didn't say it's just a fact or just a statement or just a, 
a premise. He said it's a relationship. A relationship with the Father and the Son. In which we all come together as a part of that. And John 14, 21. Go to the next passage there. The one who has my commands. He says this. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Jesus said he has a test for whether or not you and I love him. It's do you follow me? What do you do when you're in love with somebody? You pursue them, right? You pursue them, you call them, you text them, you visit them, you go out with them, you think about them, you're pursuing them in your thoughts, in your heart, you're pursuing them in the plans you make for life. You're seeking to engage with them, be a part of the life, have them in your life. You're always seeking to live with them. And Jesus says, he who loves me, the one who loves me, will keep my commands. What are the commands? How do you live your life in relationship with me? And he says this. He says, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. Now, I don't believe this means that God doesn't love the whole world. God still loved the world. He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. But you know, there are depths of love. And there are levels of love. And there are experiences of love. And He says, the one who obeys my commands will be loved by the Father, will be loved by who loves me, will be loved by my Father. I think there's a, a depth of love that you can only experience in relationship. I can say I love you. But I can't love you if I don't relate to you. Right? I can say I love everyone in the world. But I love them what? when I'm in relationship. Even if it's through prayer. Even if it's through praying for them. Or doing things to help in some way. But love is, is relational. And he says, I will also love him and will reveal myself to him. How, how can I know Jesus? Well, I get to know Jesus by what? By living in relationship with Jesus. That's how I get to know him. I do that by, by reading his word and understanding his mission and understanding his will for my life. And organizing my life and centering my life around that. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. It says, whatever you do. In word or in deed. So it's anything that you say. Anything that you do. He says, do everything in the name of of the Lord Jesus. Now that's pretty sweeping, isn't it? Everything I say, I should say as one who has a relationship with Jesus Christ and who is living for Jesus in this world. Everything I do should be done as one who has a relationship with Jesus Christ and is living for Jesus right now. He said, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We do it all in the name of Jesus. We do it all to the glory of God, to the revelation of God in Christ. I want you to think about this God-centered life. And I want you right now to think about responding. How will I center my life in God. And I want to give you some things to think about right now that can help you to think, is my life God-centered or not God-centered? Remember, God-centered is not something that I say. God-centered is something that I do. It's how I live. It's what guides my life. It's how I see things. So I ask you, first of all, what is first in your life? 
What's number one in your life? What's the most important thing, the most important pursuit, the most important person in your life? And that answer will tell you what is at the center of your life. What does your life revolve around every day? When you go to bed at night, what are your thoughts revolve? When you get up in the morning, what do your thoughts revolve around? Is it work? Is my life work centered? Does my whole life revolve around my, my work? Maybe it's family centered. Maybe all that matters is my family. Maybe it's politics or fitness or football or sports. Maybe it's school. Maybe it's a relationship with a man or a woman, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or someone else. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. You know, one of the problems with having your life centered around something else is you're always trying to control that something else. Whether it's work or family or friends or relationships, you're trying to control it and make it be a certain way. But when your life centers around God, you let go and you give control to God. And you have freedom. A freedom to live this life that Jesus promised. It's not what you say, but what you do. Let me ask you to think about this. Where do you give your best? Where do you give your very best? When you think about it, if you're going to give your all, if you're going to do the most preparation, the most, most work, the most intense uh, passion, what is that going to be? Well, that's where your life is centered. It may be, like I said, around fitness. It may be around a boyfriend. It may be around a job. It may be around work. But I'm going to give my best to whatever that is. Where do you invest? Where do you invest your money? Where do you invest your time? God gives us talents and gifts in our bodies, our minds, our abilities, our spirit. There is Holy Spirit. He gives gifts of the Spirit. Where do we invest those gifts? What do I watch? What do I listen to? What do I meditate on? What am I thinking about right now? Am I thinking about God right now? What do I think about? What goes through my mind over and over and over again? What drives your emotions? Let me ask you this. What will you sacrifice for? What will you lose sleep over? What will you give that last dollar for? What will you put away and, and give up on something you want for something greater? That's what your life is centered around. What will cause you to set the alarm early in the morning and get up at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning for some purpose? What will cause you to skip your favorite show or miss your favorite game? What would you do that for? You see, that shows what's important. And I want to call us and encourage us to be God-centered. You know, I've heard people talk about church think about, wow, what's happening here or there, and, and, and even church <coughs> itself takes commitment. I know a pastor who pastors the church at the YMCA. Think about this. Think about if we didn't meet in this room, but we met over in the gym. How could we have church in the gym? It means that every Sunday morning, people had to show up early to set out chairs. And most of these churches, they put up a light show, they put up video, they put up audio equipment, all this stuff. Every Sunday morning, people are getting up early. They're coming to church. And they're doing all this work, but to have a worship service. You see, that's being God-centered. I'm willing to sacrifice my time, my sleep, or something else, but in order to worship God and to help other people to worship God. 
is being God centered. So right now we have our time of invitation and response, and, and I just want to have you all stand for uh, for just a, a moment here, and, and I want you to say, God, what is my life centered around? And God, help me to have the faith that I need to have to center my life around you. And God, over these next few weeks, Lord, I want to start doing things in my personal life, in my life in the body of Christ, that will help me to center my life around you. So as we have our time of invitation, uh, I want to invite you to, um, to take something in your life that your life revolves around, that your life centers around, and say, God, today I'm laying that on the altar. I want to give it to you. You may want to physically come down here to the altar and just kneel down before God and say, God, I'm giving this relationship more to you. God, I'm giving this dream to you. Father, I'm giving this job to you. Lord, I'm giving this addiction, God, to you. I laid it on the altar. You may want to kneel there where you are in your pew and just sit down and bow your head to God. I'm giving this to you because I want to live a God-centered life. Let's bow our heads in prayers, respond to God as He speaks to you this morning and just come to before Him and say, God, I want to put you first in my life. I want to have that real and dynamic relationship with Jesus.